Hello. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, such a pleasure to be the moderator of the panel you're going to see in a, a couple of minutes. Um, and I'm going to try to do it as fluid and uh, entertaining as possible. And we want to make sure that you uh, have all your answers, uh, uh, your questions answered by the end of the panel. Uh, and so without further ado, and before I introduce myself, and let's uh, bring the panel uh, uh, on the stage. And I'm going to invite, uh, in the, this order, Hussein Kurenboy. He is one of the co-founders of the Programmers of Colors, and he's a Programmers of Sundance Film Festival. <laughs> Farah Clementine Dramani Istifo. She's part of the Semaine de la Critique, Festival of New doc uh, uh, Documentary Cinemas, Benin Docs, uh, Festival International Premier Film Documentaire. Dr. Farsada Farkoi, the Transformations Trans Film Festival in Berlin. <laughs> Pecha Lo, she's part of the Women Make Waves from Taipei. <laughs> Kevin Mwashiro, uh, of the uh, Film Festival. Yes. <laughs> and last but not least, another of the co-founders of uh, the uh, Programmers of Colors, Paul uh, Strutters, uh, he's from Frameline. So I'm going to start uh, this uh, first road of uh, questions uh, by just telling who I am. I'm from Argentina. I am a filmmaker and a screenwriter. And my background originally from, uh, comes from dance and eventually moved into films. I never thought I was going to be a programmer. And when I moved to LA 20 years uh, ago, um, I kind of got into it uh, by chance, uh, volunteering at a Cinematheque in Los Angeles. And Rachel Rosen, now the director of the San Francisco Film Festival, uh, gave me my first um, opportunity as a programmer. And I kind of learned my ropes with her um, through many years working at the LA Film Fest and at Sundance. And the rest is a little bit of history. I'm now senior curator for the Palm Springs Seattle and Cartagena Film Festival in Colombia, and I'm the artistic director of Cine Latino Minneapolis. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to start that way, and then we'll move. So, Hussein, can you Hi. tell us a little bit about uh, you, uh, the organization, and you know? Okay. Sorry, my, my voice has gone a little. <clears throat> it's this city. It makes everyone a jazz DJ in this town. It's not great, so excuse me. Um, hi, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Hussein Karimboy. I'm one of the programmers with Sundance Film Festival. Uh, I program mostly documentary, feature length documentaries for the world competition, for uh, the US competition, and for premieres. I also program the, some of the New Frontier Strand, which is the, the, the VR section of, of the festival that shows uh, interactive story and technology uh, projects from cross disciplinary artists from around the world. Um, yeah, we, it's, uh, Sundance has, been, a, has been, a, been around for about 30 years. We have, we have, we have a lab, a very extensive networks of, of labs to help uh, new directors f find their voices, to, to train in their craft, to hone their storytelling, and ideally to kind of f find their voice inside and not let it be uh, hampered by commercialism or the industry or pressure. It's just about you saying what you want to say and sharing your point of view with the world. Um, uh, I've been there for five years. Before that, I was um, head of programming for the Sheffield Doc Fest in the UK for about seven or eight years. It felt longer for some reason. Um, but it was, that was uh, from 2007. Before that, I was working in Australia as uh, a programmer for the Melbourne Film Festival, the Festival of Brisbane and Adelaide, where I had my own film festival before that for a year, before we went bankrupt. Um, and before that, I had filmed, yeah, <laughs> right on for bankruptcy. Um, and b before that, I, was, uh, I had finished film studies at Curtin University in Australia before, uh, af before doing a master's in film at the Victorian College of Art in Melbourne. And you're only 20. That's fantastic. <laughs> Farah. Somewhere yes. here I'm 20. The rest Can of you tell us a little bit about you yeah, and uh, your sure. organization? Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. I am Farah Clementine Dramani Sifu. I am French and uh, Beninese. I have uh, co founded two documentary film festivals in Benin and in France uh, eight, nine years ago. I am also a new uh, member of the committee selection of uh, Cannes Critics Week. Um, what I can say. And you, and you <laughs> founded another festival too, right? Yeah, in, in Paris, the Festival des Nouveaux Cinéma Documentaires. 
And the idea was to create um, a new spaces to show different images from Africa and its diaspora. Yeah. Um, Dr. Fasada. Thank you for the opportunity that I sit here and tell a little bit about myself and the festival that I'm co-organizing. Uh, I am, uh, by training, I'm a mathematician and physicist, and I'm working in university, so not a hundred hundred percent dedicated to the film programming. But in last few years in Berlin, we start organizing lots of spaces for for queer people of color and uh, with different background. And I myself is very diasporic person and. Also, myself is immigrant in this country, and and uh, and then we start doing lots of community work and at different levels, and mostly grassroots level. We, in one point, in about three years ago, we start to thinking that actually we also need to organize uh, programs that are are open and broader and connect with different. Uh, spaces in the world and films is is one of the important aspect of this cultural uh, politics that we can bring in and and so basically we end up with six queer persons of color black persons and people of color and we started creating this film festival called transformation this first edition was in 2016 and and happened in Werkstatt der Kulturen uh, uh, in Kreuzberg. And then the second edition we just did it last year and we do it every two years. So the festival is really community space mostly, but it's open to everyone, but with a focus on, on people of color and their heritage. Thank you. Pechalo, tell us a little bit about Women Make Waves, I love that title. <laughs> I'm Pei Chap, I'm one of the programmers of this festival and also the festival director. And we just had our 25th edition last October showing more than 100 films. We got really cool queer films, always sold out in Taiwan and we are probably one of the largest women festival in Asia. So, well, just like, you, you know, our festival actually play double roads for the progress of uh, film festival and film industry. At one hand, we are women festival for a niche market, so we are fighting for the male dominance film market, same in Taiwan as well. But at the same time, we are the privileged women who actually had the benefit, just like you know, certain group who got a privilege to organize that we, we, we were realizing that like a couple of years ago and realizing we are the privileged women and uh, some certain group, they are not able to program. So uh, that's what we are trying to do right now to have to diversify ourselves more. And we do have some strategy. So if time allows later on, I would like to share like three layers, how, how the transformation diversification changes within the festival and um, how, we, how we cooperate with many different people, and, yeah, and also how we align like a POC from all the Asian women festival to fight the pure, white, Western feminism voices, okay? Wow, yes. You're in the right panel, believe me. <laughs> so, Kevin, uh, can you tell us a little about yourself and your, um, the co-founder of Out Film F Festival? Um, hi, thank you for having me. My name is Kevin Mochiro. Um, like you said, uh, I'm a Nairobi boy. That's the capital of Kenya. My background's in journalism. I worked for the BBC. And um, I'm an activist, one of uh, the founder members of a couple of LGB um, an LGBTI movement in Kenya. And um, yeah, it was the Art Film Festival was set up thanks to a conversation with Johannes Hosfeld. He was uh, the, the director then at the Goethe Institute in Nairobi and a good friend. And he, he asked, you know, let's just dare. Johannes was a daring individual. And he figured, let's just program a festival. And he asked me to, to put it all together. I was everything. This was back in 2011. And... We started very humbly, to be honest. We didn't think it would be possible. It was a question of asking friends whether they had any LGBT-themed movies. 
and um, buying a few off um, Amazon and getting them to Kenya and, and, and screening that. It was done over a day of a day and a half of programming. And, and it was interesting. We didn't think it would be possible. Along the way, we just kept on thinking that the police or some authorities, someone is going to come in and disrupt the program. Um, the first night, we, we were houseful. We didn't believe that we were houseful. And um, the festival has been running since, since then. It's going from strength to strength. And um, yeah, and it's moved not just... The Art Film Festival has created a space for members of the community in Kenya just to be. We come and we watch film, and more so it is a space where we can discuss what it is to be queer in Kenya. Um, last year, we were able to see people come in, not just for the films, but for the discussions that um, happen after that. And, and it's personally, I've just seen, the, it's become a lot more diverse, it's become a lot more queer, it's become a lot more feminine, it's become a lot more feminist, and it's becoming a lot more Kenyan. Ah, yes, that's beautiful. <laughs> Paul, tell us a little bit about you and uh, Frameline. So Frameline's the longest running and largest LGBTQ plus film festival in the world. I've been working there for just over a year and our mission really is to change the world through the power of queer cinema. We have a festival which runs for around 11 days. We have about 60,000 attendees. We also have a distribution arm, we have completion funding. We also have a really important program called uh, Youth in Motion, where we send out a DVD once a year to over 1,500 schools, which has different films with some curriculum so that the young people can learn about the LGBTQ plus experience. And we also have Frameline Voices because we know a lot of countries don't have access to LGBTQ plus content. So we put a film on YouTube once a month, which they can see. Yeah, my background, I used to work in film in London. I was born in Glasgow, that's the accent. And then I moved to London, studied at the Royal Holloway University of London, ended up working in distribution and for a sales agent until I was like 28. Then I moved to Sydney, where I worked at the Sydney Film Festival for eight years, and then I was the festival director of the Mardi Gras Film Festival in Sydney for four years. And I think two proud moments from Sydney is Four, sorry, three of the four opening night films we had at the Mardi Gras Film Festival when I was there were lesbian opening night films. And I think it's really important that we center other voices at the front of the festival because then that makes them feel important and also increases the diversity of the audience. And also one of my colleagues here said that we were part of a group called the Asia Pacific Queer Film Festival Alliance. We created a collective to encourage showing more films from the Asia Pacific, so I'm proud to highlight that. And I'm also proud to be part of the Programmers of Color Collective, which is happening right now. So that's a great segue. Um, and I like to, for the people who are here who are not quite aware of what the Programmers of Color Collective is, um, and I'm going to read it because it's, you know, I want to make sure that everybody gets um, the message and the, the, everything super right. The collective was launched uh, this year at the Sundance Film Festival, and the members span five continents and hail from a wide range of film festival programs. We have um, a few of the founding members here, Paul and Hussein and um, um, Temba. Um, oh, they are raise your hand. Um, and uh, the, um, like I said, it, it was launching uh, at Sundance. Uh, other uh, founders of the, um, the collective is um, Lucy Musharki, the senior programmer of Tribeca. And during the announcement, uh, they were joined by other influential industry figures like Cameron Bailey, the artistic director and co-head of Toronto International Film Festival. Sorry. Um, oh, I lost my train. Uh, you bear with me. This digital myself is a whole new um, level. I used to have all papers, but I decided to spare the life of um, trees. And um, okay, yeah. Um, uh, so it's an initiative that was inspired by years of bias in film festival selections that are demonstrably non-diverse and nor, nor inclusive, comprising programmers who are uh, programmers of color, women, and TSLGBTQ+, and I'll let Paul under, you know, explain why we're 
have this long uh, title. The primary aim of uh, Programmers of Color Collective is not only to stimulate a conversation around the lack of programmers who are people of color at international film festivals, but also to be a catalyst of transformative change towards a more inclusive international programming pool. That's one of them, really one of the, the, the objectives of today is trying to get more of us um, into this um, group. As a collective, we feel it's important to advocate for greater inclusion of festival staff, including at senior levels, but to exp also explore how to, um, uh, that inclusivity can affect not only decision making, but the way films are curated, submissions practices, and outreach to different um, and diverse talent. As a collective, we also aim at increasing our visibility as programmers, who are programmers of colors in the more general context, that is by, un uh, by and large white, cisgendered, male and middle class. Despite the primary focus being on programmers of colors, the collective approach is inter intersectional and in its recognition that questions of ethnicity within the international festival programming pool are inextricably linked to those of gender, sexual orientation, religion, caste, colorism, socioeconomic background, disability, etc. And as we want to bring more programmers of colors into the profession and act as ambassador for those entering into it, Programmers of Color Collective also seeks to swell its rank in an effort to bring the needle forward on our inclusion international. As of today, and I checked this number, uh, we are 110 members and we are welcoming many, many more from all over the, the, you know, the corners of the world. And uh, this uh, panel is the first public event of the collective, so we're very thankful to the Queer Academy and the Teddy Award to give us the opportunity to have this panel today. Um, so I'm going to, you know, stop talking so much. Uh, and, you know, I, I, we heard your stories, but I'd like to know a little bit more about you before we delve into the um, diversity, because, you know, I, I said, you know, what, uh, who opened a door for me? How, how did I get into programming itself? And it's always beautiful to know why it's film for you, why you found in film your passion. So my question, my twofold question is, why film, when film in your life? And who was that person that at some point opened the door and let you, you know, into the world of programming? And we're gonna start, we can go this way or whoever wants to start. start. Yes, okay, Paul. So I got into film when I used to have a paper round as a kid. I used to steal magazines from the shop when I was having the paper round. I stole a film magazine once, I think when I was 12 or 13. It was Neon Magazine. And ever since then, it was like an arty film magazine in the UK. Ever since then, I loved cinema. And I studied film at the Royal Holloway University of London. But I didn't think I was a master filmmaker, so I decided I'm going to work in different aspects of the film industry to understand the marketplace so one day my films will be shown, not to make for it, but just to understand. Since then I haven't done that. And then one day I contacted someone at a distribution company, her name was Gemma Spector, and she was the head of marketing at this distribution company, and she gave me my first chance, she got me my first job for a sales agent, and then I went to work with her for Revolver Films, that led me to Australia. In terms of programming, I was really fortunate because the Mardi Gras Film Festival in Sydney was not in a good shape. And in Sydney, I was quite good at marketing. So someone approached me from the Mardi Gras Film Festival and said, hey, do you want to join our board? Like, we need your help. I'm like, nah, I don't want to join your board, but I can help you. So then we put on a small festival, which I helped program. And then the job came up for Festival Direct and they're like, oh, we really want you to do it. You've got a good eye. I'm like, uh. I don't know, and then I applied, and then that's the story, yeah. I was fortunate, it just sort of happened, yeah. Right. Well. Okay. Um, I, I, I think film found me, especially for programming. Um, like I mentioned, Johannes earlier on had asked me whether I'd wanted to be involved. I'd been in and out of the activist space for a while. I had just taken a break, and I wanted to 
go back into that space using my, my, my media skills, my journalism. And this seemed to be the perfect opportunity. There are a few of us who had been exchanging films, um, gay films, you know. A friend used to have a library and a website design company, but on the side you could get anything from, you know, a good range of, of, of um, films, just regular gay themed film to pornography that he was, you know, lending out to people who are, who are interested. And um, along the way, speaking to Johannes after many meetings, we, he, he wanted to just for create a space for that. And I was interested and, 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 and loved old world film more so, you know. Um, I, I watch a lot of Bollywood stuff, you know. I think it's all the, the saris and glitter that really gets me going. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and I just, um, I just loved it. And um, so that's, that's basically how we got into it. And it was through the Gay Kenya Trust, who partnered with the Goethe Institute. And at that point in time, it was a question of just making sure that this thing ran without any hitches, without any interruptions. Um, yeah, that's basically how I got into it. Okay. Yeah. Petra? Okay. I was... And, and, and not that we want to, I want to be, you know, personal, but if you tell us the age, because sometimes, you know, um, you know I, I know I got, you know, in love with film when I was like 10 years old, um, but, you know, not everybody gets into that. But you... Um, I think for me, um, <laughs> this is so cliche. <laughs> the love for film started with, I think, the sound of music. Oh, oh that's good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and I think I was like seven that. then. Yeah. Okay. okay. Pecha. So my age. Yes. Okay. When well, when um, you were like, yeah, film is going to be my life. Some some something like that. Because you know, programming is kind of a, a non ship. You know, you, you you once you get into that, it's just Hard to leave when it. I was 25. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, I initially, uh, I was in initially a volunteer for the festival. I studied as like a uh, subtitling volunteer, theater volunteer, and a guest coordinator volunteer, you know, things like that. And I started to share opinion to the previous festival directors. When, because I'm a child who witnessed domestic violence. So it's really obvious for me to actually find films that I feel the director is consuming the domestic violence issue when she's not involved. She doesn't want to show a film that a tear-jerking film to the audience or something. So that's the time when I start sharing my opinion to the festival director and told them that's not a film we are supposed to choose. So then I start step in and then, and then programming. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I was, I mean, when I was young, I guess around 12, when I was around 12, I thought that there's something fundamentally wrong with this word, just something deeply perturbed here. And, and I mean, I'm also a poet and I started writing poetry and unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm super dyslexic, so didn't manage to, to get published uh, properly. And, and I also, and then I realized that the, the form of poetry that I like can, can be very different than just words and writing in form of writing. And I start through, through to just collect films and connect them together and so that's my connection to the films and and right now even my understanding of poetry is just much deeper than just some words on the on paper and and I see it in the films a lot and and since also I I like the way that the stories are told so that's definitely a connection to and who gave you the, or how, how was the, I, the opening? I come to the point, yeah. And, and then, okay, I was just in my introduction, I said that about community spaces that we are organizing. And most often, we went to different places, just mostly uh, uh, in, in white queer spaces, and, and especially for films, there are film festivals around Europe or somewhere else. You see, you see that there is a kind of 
structurally, lots of violence are reproduced in the films also. And, and this, is, this is really perturbed me and, and a group of us that we were just want to make it something, film festival again. And, and we, tr we try to bring in the idea of how make a film festival with aver awareness of a structural oppression and how we just show the films that are marginalized or systematically just put aside by film programmers that are not aware of their positionality and the, the system, the cultural industry that they produce. So we didn't manage to be, so nobody gave us any job. So we start to have our own festival. And basically it's a very grassroots festival just based on donation of people. And yeah, and the festival was great so far. So that was the story. Interesting. Farah. Yeah. How was your experience and who gave yeah. you your break? Uh, nine years ago, after my studies in economics and urban planning, I was living uh, with uh, one of my friends, the Senegalese uh, director, Hamatia Chao, sorry, who was uh, working on, his, uh, on her first documentary film, Boulfale, La Voix de la Lutte. And I was uh, totally dazzled by the images I saw in her movie. And I just realized uh, the power of the of the cinema, the, the media, the images. And the images was totally different with the uh, French tradition of on-screen racism. And I said, okay, I said to myself, I have to do something. And I met two guys in Senegal, um, Arnaud Akoa and Faisal Fad Nyolofin, two Beninese people with whom we decided to create our own platform, our own festival and association, Africa Doc Benin and Benin Docs Festival International du Premier Film Documentaire. And at the same time, I was uh, just starting a new job in Paris at Belleville en Vue, and we decided to collaborate with Africa Doc Benin to organize this first edition of the this documentary film festival. So I create my own festival. Wow. <laughs> and Which is, <laughs> thank you. It, it's the tough way to do it. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say, I mean, for whoever has to produce a festival, and there are you know, many of us here, it is the toughest road you can take. But, you know, it pays off if you have Yeah. To. And I'm really happy because all these efforts, um, uh, not vain. <laughs> I met Charles Tesson a few months ago and he invited me to join the team of the Festival uh, La Semaine de la Critique, yes, in Cannes. Hussein. Yeah. You're all so inspiring. God, I feel so boring compared to you. Um, uh, so I always wanted to be a journalist. I was convinced I was going to be a journalist. I always loved film, but it was kind of the back of my head. And I finished high school, went to university to do journalism. And the first day of class, cast your mind, 1994, it's Kurt Cobain, you know, all that kind of grunge era type music. We, didn't, we weren't really critical about anything in, in the 90s, for me anyway. This is in Perth, Western Australia. And I walk into class, and I sit there, and the first thing the guy says on the, on the lecture, he goes, to get on the front page of a paper, one white person has to die. Uh, about 20 Asians have to die to get in the front page. About 50 or so Africans have to die to get in the front page. And the entire system, the economics, the political bias became crystal clear in that moment. And I sat there and I, I almost wept. And I was like, what have I done? I can't be a part of this machine. This is, this is incredible. This is before the internet even, even had happened. And I lasted maybe two semesters and I left. And uh, I left school, I traveled for a bit, I came back, I did anthropology, I did Japanese. I moved to Japan for a while, I came back to Australia and uh, finished, went, went to film school finally, did that, made a whole bunch of films, like eight films, did my master's in Melbourne, finished that, and then was like, what the hell do I do? And, because um, it's really hard like, to get a first script off the ground, to get something made, and uh, a friend got me an internship at the Festival of Melbourne, which is the biggest festival in the Southern Hemisphere back then, and I started working as a, just as a, as a publicist, and I was awful. I lost things, I came in late, I didn't know what I was doing, it was just the worst. But I heard that Abbas Kiristami was coming to the festival, and I adored Abbas Kiristami. So I wrote to the festival director and I said, you don't know me, I've lost most of your things. But, um, 
but uh, I, I, I really think that in places like, uh, places like, like where, where Kurosawa make, make, makes his films, people consider him a poet, they consider him a hero, the way we, we think of people who play sports as heroes. So he, he found me in the building and said, did you write this to me? And I said, yeah, and he's like, well, come work with us in, in, in programming. And from, from, from that door, I began uh, working for, for free, actually, for a couple of years, view, watching films and, uh, and offering advice to, to, to the program. And I realized I want to see things on screen that, that relate to me. Things that I love are not being anywhere on TV, on, in cinemas, anywhere. So I put together a program of Turkish cinema at the ACMI, and Claire Stewart, she offered me a gig. She's like, you got a month, here's like, Five grand, see what you can do. And uh, I put on a whole series of Turkish films and I thought it was just the most fun. It was so fulfilling and it was like, seeing people go, who, who are these directors? Like their backstories were incredible. And uh, f from, from that, the idea of, I wanna see what relates to me. My whole life I've had to watch films from a very dominant Western perspective that looks at Indian people in particular as something of a joke. There's no Indian people on, on, in, on screen. And when there are, when they are, they're usually in brown face up until 2000, even. Uh, and there's a show on TV uh, called Master of None that kind of catalogs this. And I, didn't even, like, I didn't even know how much of that imagery had, had colonized parts of my brain and how I saw myself. And I'm like, this has to stop. And, uh, uh, and, and that, that kind of, it's not pain, just really annoying. You know, this kind of anger. I have, to, I have to look at this point of view and accept it and think about it and have it define me for no reason, even though I'm born in, I was born in Canada, why is, that, why is that infecting everything that I relate to and the culture that's around me and how I think of myself? And it's a, it's a weird Stockholm syndrome, you know, that, that I think something like this is going to, I think, move the needle on just a little bit. Uh, and f from that, Sheffield, Los Angeles, rehab, you name it. <laughs> so you, you, uh, you know, just leave it in a, a perfect place to um, segue you know, into what we do every day and how we tackle this question of um, diversity and, and uh, inclusion and uh, um, sort of uh, this trying to bring each of us the um, most 360 worlds that you know, are coming from you know, our countries, our cultures, our uh, um, uh, backgrounds. So what are you doing? How, we're going to start from the very beginning because you're completely different festivals and you have different processes of getting the material. And one of the questions we always get as programmers is where do we get the material? How do you get to that diversity? How do you make sure that you reach that diversity? So let's start from you know, how you get the content. Not yet how you select it, but you know, where those films, those filmmakers... Uh, are coming to your organizations, and you know maybe we know a little bit more about Sundance because everybody knows a little bit more of FrameLab. But I think it's even though uh, it, people might know, it's always good to you know refresh all the opportunities you you know they have in order to get the material. And let's start with Pecha, since uh, so we change a little bit the the order, and you know <laughs> we do accept submissions. Okay. And uh, we travel to other women film festival or Berlinale, and uh, and and we yeah we have a, like a huge large programming team, yeah to find content by each programmers. Do you mind telling us a little bit about the the composition of your programming team? You know, since we're okay. talking about right. diversity in, in right. And uh, the Women Make Way is uh, it's organized by Taiwan Women's Film Association. It's an NGO. So we have 15 members. So the 15 members are responsible to, to program, to talk, to select films, discuss films. Mm -hmm. So And then we uh, carefully uh, make sure the 15 members are diverse enough. Mm -hmm. So for example, one third of them has to be elderly women. Good. One third of them has to be new immigrants or indigenous women. Okay. Yeah, so that's how it works like from those members. Okay. Great. Uh, yes, so the way that we, we work is also have, we have submission website that people submit for sure. And, and then we have a 
we have we do every every two years our festivals every two years so we have a month amount of time to search for films and and we go to other festivals and watch films for sure and and then other things that we have done over the uh, uh, last few years we were also sometimes looking at the at the TV archives also mm. to see if there is some material somewhere that it it produced some long ago for TV series. And in our festival, we can also have some sort of documentaries that also produced for TV 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And, and the most important or most time consuming, uh, yeah, selecting films time consuming, but also we just sit together and talk about what this film represent and how, how this, this film is important and why it's important. And uh, and then also we sometimes we we balance the the program by by looking at okay now we have done um, film about I don't know representation of femininity in this and that context so we need to have a program that also show masculinity also and then we 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 reflect on the type of films or type of of material that we want to show and we select based on that. So lots of films are, are, are just selected because we think that that's a perspective that is not really so often shown, and that's important to, to show. And also, some of the films are, 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 might be very old, but still we, we show it because it's, it's important for our politics. And also, in a way, is also we have, uh, since all of our programmers are, are people of color, and all of them, they're living in diaspora, uh, we have a different diasporic connections. And, and also, since also we are a very community festival also in some sense, we know that what type of films that people close to us would like to know for the background roots, thinking about identity politics. And, and that's also part of our discussion in our, our group. So it takes a month amount of time to, to talk about, prioritize, select films. And I myself, for example, watch lots of YouTube videos a lot just to, to find out, oh, that's a nice film. Is shall I contact the person and ask? Maybe the person has another film that that. So and that's that's how it works for us. Um, we are part of a network called uh, Africa Doc that promotes uh, young uh, African filmmakers. So our main. What's the name again? Africa Doc. African Doc. Doc. Yes. And it there has a website and and everything. Yeah. Okay. And uh, our main objective was to show um, African films made by Africans. So that was, this network is really important to have the good content. And we have also a film submission and we used to go to other festivals to watch movies. Um, Very briefly. I shall be brief as best as I can. Um, uh, so we, we get about 14,000 films submitted to Sundance every year, approximately, of which I have to watch about 800 or so, because it goes through, through f filters to, for us to watch. But what, what our philosophy is to have as diverse a programming team as possible. That's why, part of the reason why I joined the team was I saw that there was someone from every point of view represented in that room, because our job as programmers is to watch a film and go, I don't dig it, but if I was an 18-year-old woman, would she like it? And that's, we have to put ourselves in someone's shoes to go, is that gonna get an audience, is that gonna work for them? So our team is, is, is as, as far as I've seen, I've worked at five festivals, is the, the most, is, is, is the strongest that I've seen that has, has points of view. When people say, oh, that's just what we get submitted, we just choose that, that's completely untrue. It's about going out there and talking to people, doing the work, doing the research, having things like this, being, finding collectives and working out face to face, person to person, what are you making, what are you making, what are you making? It's a lot of, it's a lot of effort, but that's our job for God's sakes. Um, I was one of the first programmers, I, from what I believe, the only one to go to Southeast Asia out of our team. We, we, ha we have had labs out there, but I went down to Southeast Asia last year. I went to Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Australia again, um, to focus on, on meeting filmmakers there. And there was hundreds of people making incredible things 
that I just, they, they thought Sundance wasn't interested, or basically the West wasn't interested, actually. They thought that no one really cared, but it was a, it's, it's about being accessible and being open and being at a coffee table with someone for half an hour to hear about what, what they're making. At the Mardi Gras Film Festival, it was really my focus to increase films of people of color, trans, and lesbian voices. So every year I would just have a massive sheet of paper and count how many I had the previous year and just make sure I increased it because that in turn increased how many would be coming to the festival. And we do the same at Frameline. There's around five programmers at Frameline and we have a screening committee of around 60 that has a variety of folks, people of color, trans, non-binary, gay. Six zero. Six zero, a screening committee, yeah. And we get around 1,100 submissions. We are fortunate enough to get to come to a few festivals to seek out films. But as Hussein says, you have to hunt them down. For example, if we have no films from African countries, we'll research, we'll contact our colleagues. I'm going to be contacting Kevin now, we're friends. It's about creating those networks and just not giving up. And that will tie into when we talk about job prospects, because everyone says, oh, we can only interview who applied. It's like you have to seek out like the films, you have to seek out the people. We do a lot of seeking out. We have a wish list, we, we dream. You know, you watch a lot of movies out there and, and just hope and, and send out emails asking for permission, the rights to, to, to screen them, really. Um, like I said before, um, it was what we had. Those networks were our friends now. And as the festival has grown, the British Council in, in Kenya um, has helped us reach out to filmmakers in the UK as well. And slowly, it's through events like this that people are beginning to hear about um, the Art Film Festival. We're not your regular kind of, of festival, really, because of where we are. You know, we, we, I think we're more of a space that celebrates film. You know, and we offer offer that. So, um, the team right now is there's um, there's a colleague of mine. Her name is Jackie Karuti. She she's a full time artist. We all have other full time gigs, but we know there's um, for a quarter we'll be busy meeting. Um, so you mean you have a job besides yes, the festival? Yes. You're not living out no, of, no, of doing uh, your job as a you know. There, there's no money for that. <laughs> to okay. be honest, but that's um, I, I mean. Hopefully, we'll be, you know, making people coming and being able to offer jobs and I, I think being able to live out of being programmers. I mean, I, th I think that will happen eventually. I think there's a lot more structure, you know, that that is needed in putting the festival together to work, and 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 deciding how, where, and how we want this festival to grow and where we want it to go. Um, I think it is important. We keep an eye on what is happening on the continent quite a bit, especially South Africa, to see whether there's any co new content coming out of there um, and what f queer filmmakers are doing in, in the region, in the country, and in, in the wider continent. But uh, we also try and make sure if they're blockbuster LGBT-themed movies, we try and get them to Kenya because those won't make it into the main cinema halls. They won't touch that at all. So the festival tries to, to be that. So it's a lot of, like I said, you have to look. There's a lot of looking and searching. And uh, that bring, brings me to the follow-up the follow uh, question of this because, of course, now we get the material and we had a little bit of this conversation ahead of this uh, panel and is the selection process and what are the sort of um, ideas, um, philosophy, politics that go into the selection. Like you tap a little bit on, on the way you select, you know, you, you, you go maybe like in a, in a theme or a certain subject that you're looking for. Um, we, you know, mentioned in, in this previous conversation the word quality, which is, a, it's a bad word to, to talk about art, but unfortunately at some uh, tables of discussions, you know, some people will bring it. So how is that process from, you know, 14,000, you know, of course there is a lot of viewing, etc. but are there quotas, are there certain, um, you know, inside politics that have to be feel f fulfilled? Um, how do you, you know, tackle maybe a subject, very interesting subject, um, that you know you you want in the festival, but not very well made. And are you you know prioritizing the content over maybe uh, something that makes better made? Even within you know the the diversity. I mean, I'm just talking about the fact of 
we are living in a flooded world of content, you know, in, and, and we are looking and we're uh, outreaching and we get that, but how we reduce and what are we, how we get to that program that we present, because eventually we are the gatekeepers. And so even as open as we are, we're still making, you know, bias decision at some point. Can you enlighten us a little bit about that process of reducing to what we see as programs in each of the uh, of the festivals? And again, kind of demidifying or not, you know, if suddenly you're saying, okay, well, we are going to have an X number of films of this side, uh, this type, this country, this subject, you know, um, if they are imposing quotas or not, if they are open, <coughs> whoever wants to start. Um, I'll just jump in. Um, yeah, okay. I think initially when we started programming for the Outfin Festival, it was, it was important that we represented what being gay in Kenya was, where we covered, um, it was the identities, you know, making sure there was a lesbian film, a gay film, a trans intersex issues there. There were also films that covered the minorities within Kenya. You know, um, there's a there's a sizable Asian community, South Asian um, community. We sh it was important to share to show fire in in the very first first of festival and other um, um, and even last year it was important. To, religion is a key thing for for many of so for some people of the community. So there were films that had a religious slant or documentaries that tackled the aspect of being queer and and religious. Um, trans matters that we didn't get from Kenya. I still don't have it, but we were able to look into South Africa. And then that was initially making sure that the different communities and the identities that do exist within Kenya were able to find a place. And that was important. We've moved forward now to be slightly more thematic based. Um, um, and that has sort of broadened it. But we just, I think for me it is important as we move forward into the selection process that we have enough films being in a majority black country that that, that, that spectrum of blackness or is represented, but also that spectrum of color of what it is to be a minority within a minority, people living with albinism, you know, programs of people living who are differently abled. Those are the conversations, you know, and right now even that whole, um, there's the element about trans, trans, trans identities. That is becoming a lot more prevalent in Kenya, and that is we're constantly, actively asking: Is this? Are we showing not just queer film, but enough of queer film that people can identify with? And it is that is important because I think it it helps. It helps young people. It helps people who, who need to be identified. People who, to come out and say to show they're not alone. Uh, before I, you know, you, the, the rest answers, how is the audience, um, you know, and, and when it, whenever you start answering this question, because, you know, it's so beautiful what you're saying, but at the same time, I all, all the time, it's like, is there the audience? Is the audience, you know, supporting? Is, do you have, you know, problems finding your audience? Or if you do, you know, how do you go get it? The, the audience is magic. <laughs> the, the, the audience is magic, and they are, they are people who have supported the festival. Um, it's not just Kenyans who are queer, but it's anyone who lives in Kenya has found the festival a place that they can come and see alternative film and meet other people. Um, the demographic has always been largely female, and I think it's fantastic because we live in a very patriarchal society, and it's also very young. I wish when I was 16, I had that opportunity. You know, um, there was one festival we had four young Somali men come in and watch a movie. They just sat in, and that for me was, you have no idea how hard it is to be Somali and queer, but they were there. And you're seeing Muslim girls come in and, and, and find a place. There was a girl last year who came with a hijab, a rainbow-colored hijab, and I'm like, man, this is in Kenya, man. <laughs> <laughs> the audience is magic. <laughs> uh, 
for our festival, we, we have a very serious voting system. Like each film has to be voted and at least, and then discuss for at least two to three rounds to make sure that everybody agree that's the film we want. The majority of the film has to be qualified, like with really good you know, quality. But we do exceptional, as he said about like, we really need to have the audience to see the situation of the minority, within the minority. So for example, there was a time when a film about two immigrant migrant worker, illegal migrant worker who lived in Taiwan and they happened to be lesbian. Imagine how much they were suffer from the discrimination, from the racism, from the low pay and everything. But the quality of the documentary is not really good because their friend, my migrant worker, made the film. Yeah. But then we have a voting, we believe it's necessary to show the film and invite the, you know, the, the interviewees and then the, the uh, director to come and talk. And then the audience love it. Yeah. And, and your audience has been uh, growing in terms of uh, yes. attendance? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, in last, in 2016 and 2018, we have shown, I guess, roughly we shown 150 films in our festival, and I guess there's only one case. We have only one case that was a was a small, short, very personal film was one minute long, and that's why, because of the quality of recording, we asked the person, "Is that possible? We don't show that." Basically, all of the film, we never put a quality as a measure okay. of our, our, our festival. We don't care. If this is, this is a story need to be represented, if this is a story never told, if this is a story has a space in our festival, show different, different, different understanding of transness, reflect on a structure of oppression, we don't care. But from 150 films, roughly, we have one film that somehow was quality was just negotiable. And then we asked the person, is that okay? And the person said, yeah, I'm fine if you don't show it. So basically that's the story of the quality. I think it's very overrated in, in, in a way, because also it's in a way what we are living, it just, everybody has a very high quality camera in their pocket. And, and and it also reminds me a little bit, I, I talk a little bit longer, reminds me about this story of wine tasting thingy. Because nowadays, it's hardly possible to find a really bad wine, really. Because the technology is developed so that the barrels are stills and pretty, pretty good in terms of not getting sour. So quality is all just in our mind, so we can really move on from this and talk about content, and that's how we see that. Thing. And, and our audience also really like what we're doing. And, and the one small thing that I need to add also, for opening of the festival this year, we had a problem finding opening film, for example. Because we wanted to find the films that also represent Global South gender politics, from Global South narrations, and we didn't find a, a rich film that, that have many things that, that needed to, that we needed to have. So we end up with organizing a panel instead, having eight guests from Global South, gender, non-binary, trans, with different spectrum. And we start to have a discussion. So somehow when the film is not there or we, do not, we don't have access to it, we create the space that we needed to create. Can you enlighten us a little bit about, you know, without giving up a lot? Uh, the process in the Semaine de la Critique and, and the other festival that you, you know, yes. because I think also the main difference yeah. um, I see is that when you are in a larger institution with a little bit of more politics involved, you know, the decision making is uh, not always like, you know, I like this, you know, for whatever reasons and, and even if it's, you know, like something I want to show, you have some other voices afterwards, like, you know, uh, will have something to say. Um, so, Yeah, for, for, for Bin and Docs and the Festival uh, des Nouveaux Cinéma Documentaires in Paris, the, prog the programmation sorry, has to be balanced with shorts and long feature film. We try to um, show a panorama of contemporary uh, creation. Um, 
such as classical documentaries, but also experimental, video art, etc. Um, the, the idea is to show different points of view uh, on the realities of the continent and the world. And for the Paris-based festival, we used to collaborate with the association and festival in Africa and in Phnom Penh too. Um, and for the Cannes Critics Week, it's totally different because we are a committee of five people and we watch the film. I am focused on African, ASEAN and Middle East uh, cinemas and we we have meeting and we discuss. Do you ever have the position where, like, you have to fight really strong for a title, you know, against, you know, maybe something that it's more, you know, conventional for whatever, you know, in the broad sense of the of the word? Because I, I I'm gonna give an example. I remember when I was in Sundance at some point, and I was the only Latin American there, and of course Spanish is my native language, and there was a little bit of tendency to have more, at, you know, in the shorts, more English speaking. It was like naturally, even the diversified group of, of, of uh, uh, you know, of colleagues I have at the moment, and they were really diverse. It was, you know, it was their native language. And, and it was like Australian films, Canadian, New Zealand, um, UK, you know, it was just, and trying to put something in Latin American, I mean, a, apart from the, whatever it was, a documentary, a fiction, I had to fight a little bit stronger. And I always felt that, you know, for the years I was there, I was a little bit of a fighter for that piece of, you know, different thing. And, and, and it was harder for everybody to maybe understand what they're saying. And, uh, um, you know, I always wonder, um, and, uh, and it happens that you have to kind of, you know, fight a little bit, uh, uh, a harder fight to put you know, in front of the other um, uh, teammates, um, that material that may be a little bit more challenging, just language-wise, not even, you know, subject-wise, just, you know, um, so it what's your experience in, for example, La Semaine de la Critique with French well, and... I just begin the, in Semaine de la Critique, so I cannot oh. say so much thing about okay. this new experience, but for the moment, it's okay, but I will... <laughs> Tell you. Reports next year. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I will. But it was a, a really uh, tough struggle to create this festival in Paris and in Benin because it's uh, complicated to speak about black people or Africa today in France. Mm. So even in small festival, it's a real fight. Hussein, what's going on in, in, in that respect? Because with all what the, the great group... Um, Do you have to fight for yes. um, your films? There's a lot of uh, discussion in the group around if a film speaks to you and it, it resonates with you, I now have the confidence to know that if it hits me, other people will feel the same way. Um, at first, there's a kind of thing like, I don't want to be like, I'm just fighting for Asian films or African stories or, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be like just that person. But now I'm like, hey, there's millions of folks like us, you know, who are second generation Im immigrant kids who, uh, who, who want to see another point of view. So yes, it's a fight. It's at times bloody, I have to say. It gets, it gets personal. Um, but it's always enthusiastic, it's always respectful, and I'm lucky enough to be at an institute where that philosophy has been there for a long time. People do, they are open to ideas, they do listen to young directors, new voices that, that will bring an, another point of view to diaspora, to, uh, and for a while I was obsessed with cinema of the, of the, of the exile. Exile cinema is something that is just not explored enough and is fascinating. Anyway, uh, it is around having a, a very strong programming team that programs around passion. And if you're passionate about something, that speaks volumes to, to, to a group. Um, we don't have quotas. Um, I talked to a colleague the other day who, who was just here, who at her festival they had a, a European media fund quota where you have to show 70% of European films in your festival to get money. It's like, okay, for that, a quota is no problem, but we can't have quotas for like women filmmakers or for people of color. Then, oh, no, 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 what are you nuts? What about quality? Um, so after a few years, you kind of dropped the whole idea because it was just, it just wasn't, it wasn't working. You have to want to do it. You know, it has to be organic. It has to be from the heart, you know? It has to be uh, from, from the programmers, from the screeners, from the head of the festival. It has to be, it can't just be like, you know, 
I, I often call it the virginity pledge. You know, it's like, do you sign up? Like, I really want to do this, but I, I, I really want to, but I can't. I have signed a pledge. Um, we, 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 don't, we don't do do that kind of uh, programming. We don't have country focuses. Um, we, uh, the idea of quality, it's amazing. It's amazing how some of my Western colleagues will apply this criteria of quality on films from outside of Europe or the United States and go, oh, well, the craft is this and that. But the celebration of mediocrity that I see sometimes some of these festivals is like, you've got to be yep. kidding. <laughs> like, it really is so yeah. lazy ideas. There's no originality in the camera work. And there's, yeah, thank you. And there's no way I'm going to apply that kind of um, standard to films, you know, where there aren't uh, certain, pr cer certain privileges and infrastructures and income to, to make it look like that. And the point is, you know, what Sundance is for, what film festivals are for, it's like, yeah, quality. Quality compared to what? Nothing exists without something else for it to, to mean something against. Against Hollywood? that's overproduced, so sanitized it means nothing, it's so divorced from reality, it's just like watching air? Is that what you're comparing it to? Well then, yeah, sure, it's gonna, be, it's gonna look different. And if you open your eyes to that and you accept it as like trying to expand your idea of what quality is, or you can be in a little calcified corner and look at that and go, that's all, that's all I wanna see, that's all I wanna relate to. And it's boring and you'll be irrelevant in no time if that's your, if that's your attitude. I absolutely agree with you, and I and I think you know one one of the things I always say regarding of how you know eventually I select a film is if it resonates with me, mm. even if it's just one person. I remember I, I mentioned this um, uh, before. I had a person approaching me in Palm Springs once, and it was like, well, you know, the film you showed. Uh, I know it's not the cup of tea for many people, but I thank you so much for bringing. And in that moment, it's just like you know, months of work. It's just you know, that's that's exactly um, you know the payment. Um, so we're trying to, you know, bring this diversity. Where and 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 one of the things that uh, one of the points that was brought in here, and, and we tack, uh, tackle this point um, in our um, pre pre panel uh, uh, chat, is this uh, notion of not just diversity in terms of colors and sexual orientation and and everything else, but also the minorities and 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 I like you to kind of expand a little bit of of this uh, notion of when we talk diversity is not just you know this color of the rainbow, but it's also many more. Yeah. Oh, okay. You have your own. Okay. Yeah. Suppose <laughs> I'm quite fortunate. Frame line. Like when I started the team that was in place, the programming team that I worked with, were really passionate about diversity. All of us are rather sick of seeing films about four white people coming to terms with something over the weekend. So we make it our priority to really seek out films that are diverse. We have a weekly meeting where it's really our focus to really have we got anything from Asia? Have we got anything from Africa? Have we got anything from Europe? Have we got anything from the Middle East? And also really looking at other forms. Fazarda talked about uh, YouTube. We have an episodic track, uh, strand. And there are some great items out there, some great episodics centering people of color, trans, non-binary, refugees. So we really focus on uplifting that program. Last year, we had an episodic uh, centerpiece for the first time. And I think also what is really important is Centering those people of color films, those trans films, for example, our centerpiece documentary was When the Beat Drops, a documentary about bucking, and we show some of our films at the Castro Theatre, and it was great to show that because the old guard, like the 50 plus white gay men with the young people of color all coming together, and who knows next year they might come again. So I think it's really important to bring everyone together because the white audience is a bit bored of the narrative. The people of color want new stories, so it's about really bringing them together, I think. And so let's talk about the challenges and how, you know, and, and, and I like to go back to uh, um, Pecha because you, you tackle this idea of how you were looking, you know, there are like three layers, so, you know, and I, I like now that, you know, to bring that and, you know, we're going to very soon open uh, questions from the audience, but I thought um, you know, it was very interesting what you mentioned at the beginning of the panel of how you were tackling the diversity in your festival. Okay, well, uh, we think the festival, I think at some point we are quite diverse, but not diverse enough. For example, it's, we, we rarely see films on South Africa 
or films from India. It's really hard. And, so and do you, do you, why do you think is that? It's just that because you you're not African or you're not you know African you know. Maybe geographically they don't know we there's a woman make where existed or we don't really have a programmer they know much. So I think alliance like POCs is very important that we can actually exchange prog program. We can brainstorming with like other festivals. So that's what we did in 2009. Um, the, it's called NAF, Network of Asian Women Film Festival. It actually initially started from the Israeli Women Film Festival in India because when they realized they don't share same common spirit with you know, Western women festivals. You know, the Israeli, the, the festival director, she looks white, but she thinks the whiteness feminism doesn't represent her. And the Indian festival director feel every time when she went to other festivals in Western, all the Indian film they are showing are full of, what's it called, Exo exoticism? Exoticism, yeah. Right. And, uh, well, they expect that culture to be represented by, yeah. Right. So, so they thought, okay, it's, we have to voice out our Asian point of view. So that was, uh, that was uh, established. And what we do, is still going on, but what we do is that we establish a program in each festival, member festival, called NAF program. So each festival, they have to choose a film annually that represents their own culture, their own ethnic, you know, from their st point of view. And we have the recommendations and each festival have to run the like competition awards. And to show the film to invite them for a forum in each festival. And the winner of the film had to show the following year to every festival, like every member festival. So it actually worked quite well. It was it's self funded. Every every member has to pay the fee and then give the awardee. But what kind of what it's a pity that some festival no longer existed. So the problem is that well we still have a new like women festival coming in the, the China first uh, women festival join us Hong Kong join us but India no longer have a chance to have a festival. So that's another problems we have. But we're still going on. Yeah. And 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 um, for the rest of the of of the team here, uh, what are the <clears throat> sort of um, steps you're taking uh, in terms of, you know, now that you have, you know, we, we have the collective, and but what are the ideas you have in terms of how we can increase, how we do a call for, you know, the programmers of, of color or, you know, diversity out there to reach us? How do they, you know, the people who are here and see all of you, what's the next step in terms of increasing our pool of programmers, increasing our pool of diversity, 360 and, and, and three-dimensional or four-dimensionally, um, whoever wants to jump in. I mean, I know we're talking about mentorship and uh, um, uh, shadowing, and we're talking, you know, having a, a, a website where people um, can, um, you know, look for, um, you know, uh, connections between programmers, but maybe, you know, uh, Hussein or uh, or you can expand a little bit of this idea of what are the steps are being taken to actually you know put our word you know our our facts into where where our words are. I suppose the most important thing for us it's not we're like hey you need to make your team more diverse you have to have more people of color we want people to actually reflect and think about it that's why we had the photo at Sundance and we want people festivals to come to us for advice, how can they diversify their programming teams? And we've actually had two festivals already come to the Programmers Color Collective. So now we're gonna circulate their job descriptions to our 110 members. But obviously we want other people as well to join the collective people up and coming. So it's about sending out to all our networks. So if anyone has any programming jobs coming up and you can't find a person of color, you can come to us and we can circulate. There's no excuse, you know? Another thing we really want to do is we want to do what Stacey Smith did in terms of journalism because the Programmers of Color Collective, we really started it because there seems to be such a focus on diversity behind and front and then journalism, but no one's really talking about programming. So we're looking at funding foundations to do some studies because people respond to studies more than anything. So that's going to happen. And yeah, we just it's want official. to, it's official. And 
we'll create an online platform. If anyone wants to join the collective, just come and speak to me, Hussein or Temba. We'll give you our cards and we can send you details to join. We'll have an online platform coming up soon as well. And most importantly, doing things like this at every festival that one of us comes to, whether it's a panel, whether it's a meetup, just to show that we exist so that people start to reflect. Excellent. And I think it's, this is a great time to open for questions because I hope you have, and I have already one over there. So speak up or I don't know if we're, there is a mic um, that's going to be passed. Um, good. I, I have so many questions. Um, first of all, I want to say that you're all very inspiring. Um, and I'm going to Minimize it to two questions. I'm sorry, I cannot do one. I have two. One is, uh, there was, sorry, is your name Farah? Yeah, Farah, you mentioned uh, how you want to focus on African films made by um, African people themselves, and that is just for anyone in the panel. Is that something that you also focus on? Is that something that is talked about? Because in our festival, we tend to get um, quite a few, whether it's short films, features, Mostly documentaries <laughs> um, about the global south, but they tend to be made by white Western uh, filmmakers. And do you have just those discussions? And if you do, what is, is it discussed? And then the other question that I had was that we're talking, which I think it's great, about having uh, stories from other places in the world. However, uh, as an immigrant myself and as people that are children of immigrants in the Western world, I find it... Um, I, at least, uh, when I'm programming, I try to prioritize um, the diversification of Western film because I feel like in film festivals we have accepted that Western films are white and non-Western films are not white. But there is a huge, big plethora of filmmakers in the Western world who are also not white, not cis, not able-bodied, um, and not straight. So speak about that. I like hearing you speak. Um, <laughs> Farah, you want to address the first question? Um, I'm not sure to have well understood your question, um, but perhaps to explain uh, how did you, why did you, we choose to focus on African cinema. It's because uh, there there is a lack of uh, African filmmaker, and we want to help them to um, diffuse their movie on the continent and in France too, because as I told, um, it's complicated to to think about Africa, to talk about Africa and black people in France. So the idea was to change our mind um, because there, it's a little bit. Cool, nice, <laughs> and uh, I. Anyone? Yeah. I'll just say something small. Yeah. I th one of the th I, th I think one of the sectors that is hugely underrepresented or people um, aren't taking very seriously is 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 Nollywood and the power of Nollywood and the power that they have in changing the face of film in Africa, not just, just in general um, f film, but also in, in um, niche, niche programming or niche films. There, not very many people know that Nollywood has a number of LGBTI-based th f um, th films out there, but they're not talking to to us, they're not talking to us who are out in um, on the ground. You know, there's opportunity there to partner with people. There's a lot more content coming out of there. It, it there's an element of quality that comes into place for some people, but there is a lot of potential and there is a huge opportunity for collaborative work, for 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 screenings to be to, to be taken place. You know, for filmmakers who are willing to explore. And the fact that I was in Malawi last year, a country like Malawi virtually has no film sector, but there were people are glued to Nollywood. Afro cinema, as we call it, is huge. You know, there's a market, there's opportunity there um, that can be explored. It's definitely, I think, 
it's exactly the reason why this panel is happening and why the collective has you know been born literally you know the, the i think the films exist it's just that you need to get the access and we are the access because then you are like you said you know you, they should reach out to you if they want to you know get those i i was i'm i'm just going to make a very short comment that probably one of the reasons eventually many films from africa end up being made by white is okay well they get the funds because they know they're you know the ins and outs of getting funds etc cetera, etc cetera. um you know and that's kind of the the the, the story i'm i'm Tapping in, into Latin America and, and going into a part of your question, one of the, the, the sort of uh, missions I had as a programmer always is like, I, I'm really angry at the fact that normally I go any festival and I see, you know, the, the middle class, white, nice, um, you know, uh, sort of family dramas in beautiful houses happen, you know, in all the European uh, films. And then for Latin America, Argentina, Mexico, Brazil, you name it, they're all, you know, um, naked, dirty roads, you know, poor, really stingy, you know. And I'm like, I think I come from, you know, a place, a region that is much more than that. And we have many, many different things. And again, it's this reductionism, reductionism exotism, this idea that people start, you know, putting into different places. Um, and I believe this is what we are doing here. We're really, you know, making every effort to change that idea in everybody's uh, mind. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to address. I want to add one, the... one more thing. It's an excellent question you bring up, and we are very mindful of that in our programming team of like what happens when a, a person goes to a foreign land and puts a camera yeah. on something. And if you give it to a white American person uh, compared to someone, this is how Temba and I met actually. We, we, we had this very wonderfully shattering experience at a, at a pitching conference where uh, the images from the person who was Western trained were so different to someone who was from the country. The imaging, the editing, the, lent, the, the angle is so different. Uh, so we are aware of that, obviously. Um, I will say that we had a film this year at the Sundance called Gaza, from, from Gaza. And it was produced uh, by two Irish chaps who, uh, who, one was living there for a while as a, as a journalist, one was a photographer. and. And it, it, it kind of came up, you know, like, hey, this is like a, a foreign point of view on, a, on an, an, Arab, an Arab country. I'm like, but there is no w other way to get this situation out, this story out. And the, the bottom line was they portrayed their subjects with, with humanity, with dignity, with respect. They had depth and there was something whole about their approach. Then cool. Great. Can See I you in Park City. Yeah. You know? Can I add one small comment? This is uh, basically your answer, your question is really excellent. But I mean, I would like to add one very little thing to it is that also, apart from everything, but also we need to ne know our position as a programmer, that what space that we're giving to. And if the situation right now is that the, the white privileged person go and get funding by, by just rejecting their film, we're giving opportunity to somebody else that, that it, it basically destroyed this structure of, of supremacy that we are dealing with. I mean, I, I agree with what, a lot of what you said, Hussein, is there has to be a lot of respect with the people who you're filming, if, even if you don't come from that culture. We're seeing a lot of collaborative work come out of Kenya, you know, with those Rafiki. There was uh, Tom Twyka comes in. There was Supermodo, which was doing the festival rounds. You know, there was Nairobi Half-Life, where we were able to use K Kenyan filmmakers, Kenyan crew were able to learn from the expertise that we can't access. Those are, those, are, those, those are avenues to funding there that we couldn't access. And, we were, and, and these filmmakers were able to tell stories that reflected what it is like to grow up and live in a city like Nairobi. You know, so I think that there needs to be a lot of more collaborative work and a lot more discussion within, within us across our, our, um, our various um, regions and countries. And we also have to recognize that this world is huge. You know, I mean, just as, as, as Kenya, it is difficult to know what is happening in West Africa constantly. We don't have, we need to find a way just to bridge that, 
the bridge that gap and be able to now jump across um, oceans to other parts of the continent. Can I add one, one comment to that? Someone, some, some one, one script writer I know said it beautifully. She's a woman from, from, from New York, I think, and she's like, it's like being, living in a house your whole life and living just in the, in the front room. And when they go, oh, I have a kitchen, and I have a bedroom, and I have an attic, and I have other rooms to this house I haven't explored yet. How wonderful is that? And that's, that's like when you said this world is huge. It's like we're just looking at this little tiny space, but in fact, there's so much more for us to feel if we open our eyes and look, look around more. I'm sure we have more questions. Um, yes? Hi. Uh, well, I just wanna... hold, hold on for the mic so we can all hear. So I'll be briefly because I got to run. Uh, but um, so I'm half Mexican, half Palestinian. Uh, so uh, two immigrant stories, my grandparents to Mexico and myself to the US. So, but I actually made the, the first All-American Slasher with a full Latino and diversity cast. Uh, we have an actor from Algeria. And we have Danny Trejo and a lot of good American Latino actors. So um, <coughs> in, in our... Our strategy was, okay, let's make a commercial diverse movie to see if Hollywood and the world accepts this, right? And the magical thing was that Latinos see this movie they, and they love it. I mean, we sold out Guadalajara in LA, we sold out Chicago Latino, and, um, and, and they see themselves and, and it's magical. <clears throat> and then the general audience sees the movie and it just sees it as a movie, as a slasher, as a fun movie. So we've had a lot of travel, I mean, a lot of travel entering more festivals because we're not arts, it's not an artsy movie, it's a commercial movie that has uh, a full diverse cast. And also the writer, um, it's, she is a Latina, a Chicana, and our line producer is Bengali, he's Indian. And so the whole cast and the whole crew is diverse. And we've been pushing this movie for the last three years, and we've had so much travel even though Hollywood and people say they want diversity, it's very hard to, to, to understand what they really want because we we're pretty much what they what people want. And uh, when people like screen the movie, they, they really like it. It's, it's not, it has nothing out of, out, of, out, of, out of the ordinary, just an entertaining movie. So I just wanted to put that out there. So, um, that we are, there's producers out there that we're doing uh, those type of movies, uh, but we have a huge barrier um, in the festival system and also in the, in the, you know, in the distribution and, and studio system. So that's... that's Anybody it's wants called to address Murder in the Woods. This, um, Just Murder sure. in the Woods. Yeah. I, I want a short, very, very short sentence. Diversity is different than tokenism. So if you have every token from the word, still things won't be diverse. Things are diverse if the politically positionality addressed. And, and that's, that's what I call it diversity. It's about politics of representation. It's not about I have everybody in the world, because you don't. I'm sure that there are some group of community that are not represented in there. But it's about positions in the in the in the your film crew or in the programming, that 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 they are go beyond the tokenism and exercise the politics that is needed. So the politics of commerce, by itself, is not diverse. So if you make a film for commerce, this is already exclude non-commercial life, and that's part of the difficulty of life. Life is hard. We know. Well, let's, let's bring it up a little bit, I guess. Yeah, we know. Uh, more questions? No more questions? Yes. My question is um, universal or international. Uh, do you focus on, on elder queers in your programs? Society is getting a, yeah. um, older here in, in Europe. And um, it's not sexy to be 50 plus, 60 plus, 80 plus in the queer community. But I think um, it's um, the future of everybody, not being young and uh, beautiful and rich or whatever. 
I think that's a very important question because often age doesn't come up in the topic of diversity along with disability, etc. And I can speak for Frameline that we, as well as people of colour, etc., we do look at increasing every year the representation of people of a certain age. Because I think it's super important, especially for the LGBTQ plus space, because there's such a sad divide between the old and the young. And we really need to try and bring them together a lot more, not just in the films, but in the audience and at the events that we put on as well. So yeah, it is a big focus for us. And the good thing is it seems in the past couple of years, there does seem to be more films centered around people of a certain age in the LGBTQ plus community, but we need more of those films because we're sick of seeing coming of age stories with two white guys jumping into water at the end. <laughs> I'm fine. Right. Could, uh, but I like those films. Though. Yeah, they're there. We. <laughs> yeah, there is. It's a, two women. There's a very neat. Uh, there's a very. The, your question is really good and is important to to have the focus in our festival. We definitely have those films, and and for example, I just share your experience because we last year we have shown a film about somebody decided to die also. And, and it was older age and has some, uh, the, the right to extinct yourself. And, and it was a hard decision for us because the film was very long and very slow. And, and we, were, we were considering the audience. But at the end of the day, we said, no, this is important topic. And regardless of, regardless of, 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 the way that we think about the film, this topic needs to be, has a space. And this is definitely one of the important topic. Yeah, I, I, I think we need to see more of those films and I uh, appreciate your, your question because it is true what I think from all the minorities in the world and all of us, probably all people are some of the most excluded, regardless of you know, social, economic, religious, because you know, uh, people don't want to see, don't want to touch, don't want to talk about it. Um, so, yep. I'll just we add qu to quickly to that. We had a film this year called The Disappearance of My Mother from Italy. The main character, she's, I think she's about seven or something, and she's right there on the, on the panel, and she's still the coolest person you're ever going to meet. This year, uh, last year in the festival, we had a film about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's an 80-year-old judge. It made, I think, $14 million at the box office in the U.S. Uh, we had another film about Vivian Westwood. There was a theme that has happened about women who had been working for a long time and hadn't been recognized. It was just, it was just weird how they only just, just appeared at the same time. So there, there is an eye to that. There's a lot more we can do. I, I completely agree, but there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a shift, I'm feeling, where it isn't all just about being 20 and sexy and silly. We ha yes, we have time for a couple more questions. Yes, you, uh, somebody can bring... Hi, so my question is, I guess, very centered from the audience point of view in the fact that I'm adopted from Iran. I grew up in a white middle-class family, and in many ways, I'm like a cat adopted by dogs. I don't even know I'm not a dog. I am so white, you can't even begin to believe it. And it, for years and years, I couldn't even see there was a problem. Uh, I would look at movies like the ones you're talking about here and I'd be like, come on, stop whining. What's the problem? I don't even see it. So I'm thinking there's a lot of people like me out there. And now one day when you start waking up and start seeing just a glimmer of the light and you want to educate yourself, you want to go out and see something because there's got to be an audience before all of this artwork and all of these stories are told. It's not enough to tell them. They've got to be hurt by someone. So I was just wondering if you have some reflections on how to get people to actually hear the message or know that there is a message to be heard is maybe the question. Uh, basically how we reach that audience, how we nurture that audience. We, we tapped, um, I, I mentioned this earlier, um, you know, the young people who are not going to the movies and they're you know, seeing a different kind of uh, uh, content and um, so, I, th I think the challenge is um, how you, you know, no, not only how we diversified our, our program and make it, you know, uh, more um, expanding in every direction, but how we reach 
even more diversified audience, because we mentioned at some point that some of our festivals, we have diverse programming, but our audience might not be as diverse as it should be. So it's also part of our challenge to you know, work every day trying to reach every one of those niches. You know, and and I, I speak with myself, I tap every door and every year I'm like, okay, I done it last year. No, no, every year I have to talk to every different, you know, you know, minority or not, or call it whatever you want, just trying to convey the message that we have a film like that in the festival. Just, you know, and, and it doesn't matter if it's a big festival and we've been there for many years, still, you know, getting that that person to come, the 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 knowledge that we are, um, for example, one of the things I do all the time is uh, demystifying festivals itself because a lot of people think that festivals are for white people, for rich people, for intellectuals, for people who are bright, who will understand. And maybe someone who goes, uh, um, you know, uh, to see some other uh, kind of content, they don't see festivals as a place for them. So it's a whole other uh, world. But I'd like uh, you to, you know, we have a maybe Right, we actually call ourselves gorillas because we, after the festival shown in the major cities, we do touring nationwide. Like we just call like bookstore or you know people like there are several like Christian anti and <laughs> LGBT group. We just go there and then show films and confront them the after the festival. <laughs> so it's like a tour nationwide. We do that and then we have a funding for that for the government. So you know. <laughs> The, 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 um, those, those places who, who want to show the film, they don't have to pay anything. We just go there for three months. So normally we go to like more than 100 places wow. in Taiwan. And that works, that works very well. I think what you said. <laughs> I think what you said is very important about marketing. Because I remember when I started working at Sydney Film Festival, the artwork was of these posh dogs dressed up and they did it for the second year round. Then there was a new head of marketing that came in and he really made the artwork brighter and younger to attract a younger audience. But I think also when it comes to Pacific films, when I used to work in marketing at Sydney Film Festival, we'd call it grassroots marketing. And we would really target every audience possible for each film through the embassy, through the consulate, through the universities, through the African studies teacher. I think it's really about target, 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 and then you can find them and then hopefully they come. I would like to add also something. Your question to me resonates much deeper than creating a film program, to be honest. Because I personally also, for example, involved in Gay Museum Berlin, so I'm a board of director there. And, and when I want to, for example, uh, uh, appropriative art things hang on the wall, and I need to talk to my colleagues about what, what's wrong with this, uh, with this thing. Somehow I end up with the same problem that you had. What's wrong with it? Uh, people say that what's wrong with this. And, and I guess that's a matter of resources. That's a matter of resources, that how much resources that we, as a kind of people that structurally don't have enough privileges like white, white people or, or capitalist people or whatever, that they, we don't have that resources to, 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 to elaborate on our discourses. So that's a matter of empowerment also, how to empower audiences that can be benefited from from the, from the material that we produced, and having a political dialogue about this film that has to be shown because of this reason, because of this political dialogue. So it's a very hard, and I sometimes, if, if I knew how to solve it, I would have solved so many problems in the world. But, I just want to say, um, to use an NGO term, um, outreach similar to marketing. You just have to go out there to the people. You have to go out there to the audiences. When, um, Raf when we were given uh, um, the seven days within which to screen Rafiki, but when it was unbanned for seven days, there were efforts by um, LGBTI groups in Kenya, not just to have the, sc the, the screening in Nairobi, but to the other major cities 
within Kenya. So it went to a town called Kisumu, it went to a town called Malindi, and they were buying out movie theaters, and it didn't just stop there. It was telling people, if you're a member of the community and you can't afford a ticket, just come, just come. You know, people needed to see this. And, and I was in Mombasa, a town by the coast, and there's, there's, a, there's a lady, an, 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 an Indian lady, who came up to one of my friends and said, my daughter's been talking about this film. And she's like, mommy, mommy, you have to come and watch this thing. And the fact that it was not in Nairobi, but it had gone to Mombasa. Outreach. You know, festival work doesn't just stop during the festivals. Take the movies out to the people as well. I'm going to leave it at that because I, we have to wrap up. And I think taking uh, the movies to the people, it's a beautiful way of ending this conversation. And we could keep talking with you all. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you.